Good day. You're welcome to section five of data network security one. Section five deals with cross-site scripting. In this section, we'll look at what cross-site scripting is. We'll explain what cross-site scripting entails. We'll look at some reference to actual examples of cross-site scripting. We'll conduct some, a couple of cross-site scripting attacks and see how to prevent them. Now, what is cross-site scripting? This is another common web application that attackers use. And this has been used over the years. Now, if a web application is vulnerable to cross-site scripting, an attacker can introduce some malicious script within a web. And this, once introduced, executes the page accessed by the user. Now, a malicious script that is echoed back into the HTML now returns from a trusted site and runs under a trusted context. So what are the implications of cross-site scripting? Now, a cross-site scripting attack uh, enables the hacker to steal your cookies of the domain you are browsing. Also, completely modifies the content of any page that you see on a domain or on that particular domain. And they can track every action you do in that domain from that moment onwards. You can also be redirected to a phishing site, a site that looks exactly like the site you were browsing. And if there are any vulnerabilities with regards to that site, the attacker can exploit those vulnerabilities and at the end of the day take over your machine. This and a few are some of the implications of cross-site scripting. Now, for example, if we go to the, our demo website, which is the arturomutual.com. Now, assuming we enter into the search engine, the search field, hack the planet. Now, once the go button is clicked, now the search string appears in the get request on the page that you find yourself in. Now, source codes could allow HTML and JavaScript to be injected instead. Now, if you look at the URL, you see that we have in there the text field that we just typed, hack the planet. And that same field, or that same field is seen in the browser where the search result is. Now, with this, an attacker can, in place of hack the attack, do anything, or hack the planet, do anything to that URL. So for example, instead of writing hack the planet, we introduce some bold commands and some header files using the h1 tag. Once that is done, we can easily see that hack the planet is bolding. So that's one way an attacker can hack into your system. And once they get into your system, they're able to do anything. So viewing the source reveals the HTM tags are injected into the page. Now, in place of, so once the attacker knows that your plain text comes into your URL, now in place of that, the attacker can now put, or can now inject a script. And that script maybe is to open a new window. So we see the script at the URL, come starting with the script and ending with the backslash script. Once this is executed, we realize that a new window opens or a new site opens. That looks just like the one you are browsing. So that's one way an attacker uses cross-site scripting. Now, what are the processes with regards to cross-site scripting? So we are looking at the explicit process. So for instance, a link to a vulnerable application or site is sent to your email. Of course, via your HTTP protocol or your hypertext transfer protocol. So you get those emails in form of spam, usually. 
So evil.com or evil.org is the application sending the vulnerable email. Okay, so once it gets to the user, the user, of course, rep responds to this email. So the user sends some script embedded as data. So probably you send your username and password. You are accessing your bank account. So bank.com is where we are accessing. Now, once you send the command to your bank, your bank in turn also sends you a response in form of data. Now, once this data arrives to the user or the user's browser, automatically a message is sent to evil.org. So the script sends you your cookies and session information without your consent to the evil.com. And once it gets to evil.com, which is the phishing site or which is the site that sends the vulnerable application, they use your information and now impersonate you to the bank. So this is how cross-site scripting is typically executed. So these days, most modern browsers protect against cross-site scripting. So we have Internet Explorer, we have Firefox, we have Chrome. Now they even pre prevent cross-site scripting from executing when it is present. Now, however, it's still not enough. Despite these browsers are doing this protection or serving us or blocking these vulnerabilities, it's still not enough. Some developers also are now in the habit of still doing this cross-site scripting. And that vulnerability should never be present in a web app. So it has to be avoided. So some example of cross-site scripting is the Italian bank's cross-site scripting opportunity seized by fraudsters. So we have this as far as 2008. And of course, when we go to the web site, which we have been referencing, the webappsec.org, we can also see projects in that regard. So an example of a working or a working example will be found at Sakai, uh, where we are using the acme.com site. Here we have a site, and this is to be added to our mailing list and eligible for special orders. This is a site that has been created. So it takes in your name, it takes in your address, and it takes in your email. And once you are successful, a mail is sent to you. This is a phishing website. Now, with this website, an attacker can, instead of the name column, an attacker can put a script in there. So we see script alert cross-site scripting, just for example. And once this is executed, we have some form of pop-up coming up. It says username contains invalid character. So this tricks the user to think that they have been logged out of the system. And here we can see the Temper app being used, and that can be found, especially in the Internet Explorer, that can be found at the top right corner. Once you click on it, you see the parameters that comes with Temper. Now, so this gives you some indications that your site or whatever credentials you have provided is invalid. Let's take another example for the ACME administration console. So here you provide your username and your password. So it says that you don't have access. It gives you some pop-up. Now, once the pop-up comes, when you click OK, you are able to see the details. Because you are the administrator, you are able to see the details of some list in your browser or in your application. Now let's go back and see what happens if the hacker enters a more complex and malicious script. Now when you this is in a Sakai, so you get to do a hands-on practice on this. So this script will lead the user, in this case the administrator, to believe that they either haven't logged in properly or have been temporarily, temporarily logged out. 
So we see the same things happening. Input your username and password. And once the administrator has submitted his credentials, he is returned to a screen that he was expecting. So that looked exactly like the form he was looking at or he or she was looking at with the list, the names and email address with the ability to edit. Now, once the administrator is doing that, on the server side of the attacker, you are intending, you, or you intend provide unknowingly your username and password, which the hacker can name on his or her PC as harvest. And so it sees all the email, at, it, it sees all the usernames and password, including you, the administrator, and other people that are logged on to that system. So at the, at the attacker's web server contains a text file containing the administrator's login credentials and the credentials of anyone else who fails or who falls for the scam. So for cross-site scripting, in another example of phishing, we will look at the ACME customers. And like I said, all these are in the Sakai platform that you get to do a hands-on on them. So these are some examples of the sites. We have here, a user has been sent an email, and inside the email, a website has been provided. And this is what we are calling the phishing site. So once the user clicks on this website, it takes the user to another page, or it takes the user to a page where you are provided to, you are asked to provide some details. Now, I know this, most people have been victims of this. You receive some spams that you are supposed to provide your account details, you are supposed to provide some very critical information. And once those sites have not been verified and you click on them, you are exposing your systems to some vulnerabilities. So here the, the link or the web address provided, URL provided, sends you to a new page where you are supposed to provide your details. And once that is done, the attacker capitalizes on that and takes in your username and password. Now, how can we fix cross-site scripting? We are saying the first to look at is the input validation. So validate every input that one is provided. We are talking about the length, the type, the syntax, and some business rule if they apply. As often as possible, only accept known good values. So instead of characters, letters, you can accept real values that is supposed to be provided. And this is a positive security model. Now we have strong output encoding. So encode all your outputs. And it's best to encode all characters. And this is an approach used mostly in the Microsoft anti cross-site scripting library, and also open web application security project. They deal with the PHP anti cross-site scripting library. Now, encoding is not a, a complete solution by itself, so it means more work has to be done. Now, specify the output encoding also. And here, Sakai will provide, or the, the, the link we provided in, in Sakai will help you to actually have a hands-on on that. Now, also watch out for canon canonicalization, okay? Now, the input should be decoded before trying to sanitize it. And this is a good example for why a positive security model is best. So, in lab three of Sakai, you see how to exploit cross-site scripting. And upon completion of this exercise, you'll be able to exploit a cross-site scripting vulnerability. So see lab three in your Sakai platform, and you'll be able to do this hands-on. So in this model, I've been talking to you about cross-site scripting. We've looked at some malicious scripts, which have been echoed from a trusted server and rendered in the victim's browser. We've also looked at some actual examples um, with respect to www.webappsec.org 
it's a site you have to visit to get more examples. And we've seen how to exploit vulnerabilities or cross-site vulnerabilities and how to fix them. Once that is done, you should have more knowledge in cross-site scripting. So this brings us to the end of section five. I'll see you in section six.